High Representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy and Vice President of the Commission, Mr. Joseph Borel Fonteyes. Good morning to everybody, dear Minister Jenes, dear President of the International Committee of the Red Cross, Diana Spoljaric, estimated Martin Griffiths, United Nations Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, an emergency relief coordinator, you must have a lot of work, dear Filippo Grandi, United Nations HRC, and dear Janes, Commissioner Energic. Colleague and friend, both, ladies and gentlemen, you have already mentioned this, but uh, allow me to repeat it again. There are more people in need uh, of emergency assistance than ever before. Things become very bad, much worse every day. Let me go through some important points. The first one, you will not be surprised is a situation in Gaza. I will have a look at that from not only humanitarian, but also political point of view. Gaza is not longer controlled by anyone, not by Hamas, not by Israel. And the territory of Gaza is very quickly becoming a territory without any kind of a order, not a state, but a single order. It's more and more looking like Haiti like Somalia, like Syria, or Mosul. This will be the first failed state before having existed. All territories beyond the control of a state become spaces captured by armed groups, organized gangs, living of trafficking of all kinds, which uh, basically leave population with only two options, immigration, or terrorism, or both. This is something that uh, I was already said in December, and now it's everybody agreeing that's what is happening in Gaza. In Gaza, we are no longer on the brink of famine. We are in a state of famine, affecting thousands of people. Chancellor Scholz told Prime Minister Netanyahu, we cannot stand by and watch Palestinian stuff. Okay, then what are we going to do? We cannot stand by and watch Palestinian stuff. What are we going to do? Because this, is, this for me is not a, a natural disaster. It's not a flood, it's not an earthquake. It's entirely man-made. By whom? That's there to say it. By whom? By the one that prevents humanitarian support entering into Gaza. By the lack of access. By the acute insecurity inside Gaza. Insecurity in itself prevents uh, uh, distribution of support, of help, but the problem is that hundreds of talk, trucks are waiting in the border, and the ones who control the border prevent them from coming into. I'm coming from Washington, and I dare, I dare to say, well, yes, Israel is provoking famine. Oh, how do you say that? What evidence do you have? Come on, what evidence do I have? Hundreds of trucks are waiting to enter. And it's absolutely imperative to make crossing points work to effectively and open additional crossing point. And it's just a matter of political will. Israel has to do it. It's not a question of logistic. It's not because the United Nations has not provided enough support. The support is there, waiting. Trucks are stopped, people are dying while the land crossing are artificially closed. And yes, it's good to look at uh, support by sea or by air, 
But we have to remind that we have to do it because the natural way of providing support is being closed, artificially closed. We send parachutes <laughs> in a place that is one hour by car from the next airport. <laughs> Why don't you send it by the airport? Because they don't let. This is unacceptable. Starvation is used as a weapon of war. Yes, starvation is used as a weapon of war. Let's, let's say that. And it's not a question of a lack of sufficient supplies. We hear that there are several months of food stock on the Egyptian side. Several months of food stock. And even more than in many other conflicts, children are suffering most in Gaza because they have nowhere to go, nowhere to hide. So I would like to encourage you to encourage the call for action for children affected by the war in Gaza. This is a war of children. More children have been killed, killed in Gaza on this month than in the whole world in the last four years. We need to work with Israel, yes. We need to work with them. And some potentially promising signs that we have seen in recent days of uh, a little bit of willingness to facilitate new additional land routes into the north of Gaza. Second, about the actors. Most notably, UNRWA. UNRWA, UNRWA is the last lifeline for many. No other agency has the staff and capacity in the ground to provide support. Yes, UNRWA is facing allegations allegations. And we wait with interest the result of the ongoing independent investigations and the Corona Commission set up by United Nations Secretary General. Yes, but let me remind one thing. UNRWA exists because there are Palestinian refugees. It's not a present of the international community to the Palestinians. It's an answer to their needs. And even if UNRWA disappears, the Palestinian refugees will not disappear. They will not disappear by making UNRWA disappear. It's important to launch this message in a moment in which many countries, Canada, Switzerland, are restarting their support to UNRWA. And I hope that the European Commission will, apart from the first package of financial support, quickly provide the rest. The second point I want to take is about the alarming situation in other places in which we face war. In Ukraine, Russia shows no respect for international humanitarian law neither. 14 million people are in need of humanitarian assistance. In the Sahel, terrorism and reactions of military regime are exacerbating instability. One in five of people in Burkina Faso, Mali and Niger makes 17 million people depends on humanitarian assistance. Sudan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Ethiopia, Yemen, Nigeria, and Myanmar. This is the list of the most awful crisis where tens of thousands of people are being killed in internal fight. And Yanis uh, knows better than I how many people are in need of humanitarian assistance. My last point is about the humanitarian funding gap and the need for global outreach. Humanitarian funding should be a shared responsibility. Unfortunately, this is not the case. In 2022, the three largest global donors accounted for 64% of all humanitarian assistance. You have said that, the Annex. Uh, we have to increase and broaden the donor base going beyond the European Union and like minders And our global outreach efforts should not be limited to funding. We need to increase our respect for international humanitarian law. We see unacceptable levels of violence against humanitarian aid workers, which risk their life more and more, working in dangerous contexts. Humanitarian action cannot stand alone. We need to work together to find solutions to the drivers of humanitarian needs. And for that, increased multilateralism in international relations is a must. I hope that the 
Summit of the Future in September at UNGA will be a key opportunity to reinvigorate global commitment to multilateralism. We see at the United Nations Security Council more and more vetoes and less and less agreements. And in particular, in these dramatic circumstances, the vetoes in, uh, doesn't allow to take political action. I hope that in the immediate future, the discussion in the United Nations Security Council will allow for a ceasefire in Gaza to freeze the hostages and to increase humanitarian support to the Palestinian people. I hope the UNGA in September will be an opportunity to reinvigorate our global commitment to multilateralism. And I hope that this forum today will send a strong message of the continued support from the European Union and our member states to engage to address humanitarian crisis through the world. Yes, we need good Samaritarians. We need people to support people in need. But uh, stop with the cocodrile tears. We have to take action in order to prevent what's happening, not only complaining about it. Thank you. <clears throat> Indeed, those definitely, to me at least, felt like very bold and uh, courageous words. Thank you very much, Mr. Fonteyes. Um, and uh, now we would like to welcome to the stage the UN uh, Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator, Mr. Martin Griffiths. bad luck to have to follow that speech. <laughs> um, congratulations. Congratulations. Excellencies, thank you very much for inviting me to attend, to participate, to speak the beautiful location. Uh, but don't worry, contrary to what the minister says, I'm not going to sing. So the world is in a bad enough state without that. We'll get by. It's a pleasure, it's a privilege to be here, the third one. Um, I get bigger every year. It's a unique event. Um, huge thanks to the presidency, the Belgian people, the Belgian government. And thank you, of course, to Janesh Echo EU uh, for this opportunity. We all share common goals, I think. We share the common goal of a peaceful, more humane world, and we all know the challenges. An age of war in which reaching for the gun is increasingly the first option. We see this in Ukraine, we see this in Sudan, we see this elsewhere. An age in which the United Nations, for example, is prevented from doing its job and is then criticized for not doing enough. We see this in Gaza. And an age in which gangs can run an entire country, as we have seen in Haiti. It is shameful for all of us. As international attention frantically races from one big crisis to the next, we are failing to resolve those that came before. Syria, Yemen, as I know, and Mali alone account for almost 35 years of war. Across the world, civilians and humanitarians are being killed in unconscionable numbers. And a moment of peace for the leadership of UNRWA and the tragedy of those who have fallen in Gaza. Rampant food insecurity and malnourishment as humanitarian access is treated 
as optional or indeed wielded as a weapon of war. Displaced people, as many of us have had the awful privilege of seeing, languishing in host communities and camps for years, years on end. My most vivid example of that from travels this last year was in Rakhine State in Myanmar, where a Rohingya camp, a woman whose home was, I think, about 20 kilometers down the road, but she had been 12 years in that camp. 12 years, three children. What did she ask for? Birth certificates for her children. The opportunity to return home. And yes, a livelihood. Something beyond a dependency on aid. Women and girls facing entrenched inequality, and has been said by Yanish, a pandemic indeed of gender-based violence. I grew up in the Congo in your, in your era, and the terrible facts of what is going on in the east of that country makes us wonder whether we share any common humanity. Soaring climate change, pushing more and more people towards the mouth of disaster. And despite the valiant efforts of donors, huge credit to those here today, huge credit, Janesh, to you, to protect humanitarian funding amid challenging economic times, I commend you for your protection, Janesh, also for the pledges that you have announced today. We are facing an alarming funding crisis. For example, just pick one example. We are at present in Sudan, where we face the needs of 25 million people, 4% funded for this year, 4% after the first quarter. And I know Filippo would say the same for the needs of those in the neighboring countries. We are all, and our colleagues in the field, in particular daily, making extremely difficult decisions. Decisions about life and death, about what to fund, who to prioritize, a sort of godlike powers over the prospects for people. I'm more convinced than ever, not just because of these crises, but also out of a sense of values, on the need for a step change in how we deliver assistance. This has to start with a more precise understanding of what people in crisis really need. Not what we think they need, what they think they need. Many, as we know from many surveys, do not feel heard. We need to learn how to listen. Last year, we launched what I have perhaps ludicrously called a flagship initiative in four countries to pioneer this, what is written here as a more collaborative approach. It's more than that. It's an approach which gives leadership to those people we intend to serve, to serve, to note, not to lead, but to serve. We need to become less reactive more proactive, better at building community resilience by the community. For that woman in that camp, 12 years with no livelihood and but a, an hour from her old home. We need, thanks to Germany also for their leadership in this, more anticipatory action to help people get ahead of predictable crises, reducing humanitarian impact and cost. More flexible funding, We'll be hearing this for the next two days, that gets support where it needs to go fast, including to local actors and groups directly. We have many mechanisms to do this. We can do more with those. And we need to distinguish and support and respect the leadership of women and their organizations locally, globally, uh, so that we can help them to show us how better to do our work. And more community investment across the board, particularly on tackling climate change, breaking down silos, 
to provide humanitarian support alongside greater development and climate finance. Breaking down silos in front of those communities, not in high-level panels, but in, learning, in listening together to the needs of those we serve and passing between us those aspects which we can produce a response. This is a lot on our plate. We are trying to change the business model at a time, as we have heard, when the world has never been as bad, certainly in my long age, as it is today. We're facing protracted, complex political crises. We need that political will, as has been said. We need it desperately. We must not be allowed to be left alone helping people. We must allow the people to go away from us, back to their lives, and to have, I believe still, the hope for the future. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Griffiths. Um, and before we begin the all-important pledging segment, uh, I will now pass the floor to the President of the International Committee of the Red Cross, Ms. Uh, uh, Mirja, Mirjana Spoljaric. Representative, Commissioner, Ministers, Excellencies and colleagues. From Gaza to Ukraine, Sudan, Yemen and the Democratic Republic of Congo, the International Committee of the Red Cross witnesses a global failure to protect civilians in armed conflict. States must urgently act on their obligations under international humanitarian law to prevent and minimize this intolerable suffering. Humanitarian action cannot be a substitute for, nor should it distract from the lack of political solutions. The European Union and its member states have supported international humanitarian law and principled humanitarian action. And today I urge you to do even more to uphold your collective responsibility and exert your political influence in three areas. First, as you make respect for international humanitarian law your political priority, reaffirm the universal values of humanity and equality. Seventy-five years ago, the world rallied around the Geneva Conventions to set limits to violence in war. Victory at the cost of humanity was no longer considered an option. Today I ask you to reaffirm your commitment to the letter and to the spirit of the Geneva Conventions. Because interpreting international humanitarian law with increasing elasticity creates a dangerous precedent. Beyond words and as part of your obligations, you can influence warring parties to respect the rules of war and reduce people's suffering. And second, ensure all people affected by war and violence, even in neglected contexts, have access to humanitarian assistance and protection. When the media interest is wavering, states can still maintain their political attention. You can increase quality funding, predictable and flexible, as it enables impartial and independent humanitarian action. And the ICRC, with the Red Cross and Red Crescent National Societies, remains committed to working alongside communities to address protected needs. And third, protect the work of neutral and independent humanitarian actors. Red Cross, Red Crescent movement workers and volunteers operate in an ever riskier environment. Deplorably, some of them have been killed and injured. Humanitarian action is increasingly instrumentalized and discredited, including in the digital space. 
I ask state and political leaders to publicly back and support neutral, principled, and impartial humanitarian action. Because as divisions widen, with these three steps we can build from what we have in common. It's our humanity to ultimately lay the foundations of peace. And before closing, I want to thank my previous speakers for their statements. I really thank you for the support. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Ms. Spoljaric. Um, okay, it's now time to begin the pledging segment. Um, and to officially introduce that section, I'd like to invite our host back to the stage, uh, Minister Genet. Welcome back. Very briefly, dear uh, colleagues, I uh, strongly like to welcome on stage all my colleagues for the pledging segment of this opening session because uh, everybody has mentioned here before we encourage all member states to implement the Council conclusions of May 2023 on the funding gap. The Council reaffirms the collective commitment of the EU to provide at least 0.7% of collective GNI as ODA by 2030. And the Council encourages also its member states to close the humanitarian funding gap by contributing at a level corresponding with their financial means. So member states should ensure that an appropriate share, let's say 10% of their ODA, is devoted to humanitarian action to meet existing needs. And firstly, I'd like to invite Poland as the next co-organizer of the European Humanitarian Forum to pledge and to speak on their implementation of the Council conclusions. And after, dear colleagues, all member states will follow in order of their contribution in proportion to their gross national income. Thank you. Indeed, yes, Mr. Ladies and gentlemen, what we've just heard is grim. On behalf of Poland, I salute the humanitarian community for their untiring efforts in finding ways to deliver aid and save lives. I also acknowledge the generosity of donors dedicating always limited resources to alleviate human suffering. Poland is doing its share. Over the last two years, we have become a major humanitarian donor to Ukraine, which is our neighbor, against whom Russia launched a brutal war of aggression, sparing the largest refugee crisis in Europe since World War II. In 2022 and 2023, the Polish government spent a total of 16 billion euros to provide assistance to Ukraine and Ukrainian war refugees. This will remain Poland's number one humanitarian priority, but Poland also contributes to reducing the acute needs and suffering in other humanitarian emer emergencies, including in Africa, Middle East, and especially Gaza. This year, the humanitarian budget of the Polish aid program is planned above 10 million euros. I don't feel I need to persuade anybody here that we need to do more. What I do want to say is that, apart from the noble cause of easing human suffering, we also have a direct political interest in being more generous towards who are less fortunate than ourselves. Let us not forget that the 2015 migration crisis was partly caused by the shortage of funds for feeding refugees. Poland will again do its part. As has uh, been mentioned, in the first half of 2025, we will hold the presidency of the EU Council, 
we will engage actively with you and we will, as has been said, co-organize the EU Humanitarian Forum next year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Sikorsky. Um, next, we have the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, uh, Mr. Xavier Bettel. Dear colleagues, uh, sometimes you are proud to be a first speaker, uh, and this time I'm proud. It's not because uh, of the size of the country, but because of the contribution. And uh, just to tell you that uh, after being Prime Minister for 10 years, to see that we still skip and keep 1% of GDP for humanitarian, and, uh, humanitarian action and development um, is something so important for me. And I know especially that uh, in a few months we will have European elections and usually extreme right parties, the first budget they like to cut is the one to help others abroad. And we should realize that uh, it is, we saw it in Sweden, we see it in different countries. So please uh, do not forget that also when you put your ballot. We have 15, but I think uh, they have not a lot of chances here in this room. Uh, with 15% uh, of our official development uh, assistance is allocated uh, from uh, our uh, budget, and uh, also I want to commit today that 80 million euros for humanitarian assistance will be foreseen in 2024. Uh, um, I am not the first speaker. You heard about uh, Ukraine. You heard about uh, Gaza. Uh, it's, uh, it's a shame usually that when people see on TV that very often then we react because we should not forget also what's happening in RDC or what's happening in Sudan. But um, what we see nowadays, uh, and the Pepe said it uh, clearly, is the fact that uh, innocent people are killed every day. Children, women are killed every day. And in fact, if we don't react, and when I hear that it's a fight against the Hamas, this uh, young population just will have one hate image in head, and this is not the Hamas. We will build by not acting a Hamas future in this region, so it is so important to support humanitarian aid, but also education for um, young and next generation. Um, we just also heard from the Red Cross about it, the digital thing, and I want to inform you that since this year, it's the first year that the ICRC Global Operational Cyber Hub a safe space enabling the conduct of meaningful research and development of purposeful resolutions in the field of tech, diplomacy, digital transformation and data protection is on. This I had to say, so it's done. I wish to all of you a nice meeting and I don't need to convince you inside the room. But please try to explain to people if they don't understand why humanitarian is so important that we have luxury problems when other people in the world would love to know, not if they eat hot or cold, but if they will be able to serve something to the next generation. Thank you. Thank you. Beautifully said. Um, before I introduce our next speaker, just a gentle reminder, please, to all of our speakers and pledges, please do try and keep to time so that uh, we can move on swiftly with the program in time after this. Um, next up is the Minister of State for Europe and Climate, Dr. Anna Lurman. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we have already heard many speakers this morning sounding the alarm over the extraordinary scale of human emergency that we face this year. Violence continues to upend people's lives and the climate crisis is impacting the most vulnerable. Russia's brutal war of aggression has triggered a humanitarian crisis in Ukraine. A new war in Gaza has pushed many women, children and men to the brink of survival while innocent civilians remain captive in the brutal hands of Hamas. We urgently call for a humanitarian ceasefire to bring much-needed relief in this unbearable situation. It is critical that we continue to work together to push for more border crossings and increase the influx of aid into Gaza. Airdrops will help to ease the suffering 
but are by no means sufficient. Germany is working tirelessly with humanitarian di diplomacy. We have tripled our humanitarian assistance to Gaza from 73 million euros to 238 million euros. We are the largest donor in this crisis. And while we rightly redouble our efforts to address the situation in Gaza, we must also not forget the plight of Sudanese, of Yemenis, of Ukrainians, and so many others in need of urgent life-saving assistance. Many of the humanitarian crises and most of their consequences, including protracted displacement, are man-made. It needs political solutions and the willingness of those in power to live up to their responsibility for their own population and to ease and eventually end their suffering. We also need ambitious climate action globally to prevent further human misery. In the meantime, turning a blind eye is not an option for us. Germany stands in solidarity with those most in need. We are proud to remain one of the world's top humanitarian donors. This year, we maintain our humanitarian budget at over 2.2 billion euros. We therefore, but however, the funding gap, gap continues to deepen. We therefore continue to urge all to join ranks and to make av available adequate levels of humanitarian funding. Last year's EU Council conclusion set the benchmark devoting 10% of ODA to humanitarian action would be an important step. But funding is only one part of the equation. We also need to maximize the impact of each euro spent. We need to make sure that the humanitarian system becomes more agile, more flexible and efficient. We need to shrink the needs. Anticipatory action is therefore key to prevent suffering and displacement. In the grand, grand bargain, we are currently hammering out a framework to scale up anticipatory action and to increase prevention efficiency and flexibility. Our efforts should focus on prioritizing life-saving measures. We know that this often requires hard choices. We therefore welcome the humanitarian agency's restructuring processes that contribute to increased efficiency. As we continue to work together, let me pay special tribute to those working at the forefront of humanitarian action. Humanitarian workers who put their own lives at risk to help others. Supporting them and their efforts should be at the top of our priorities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Leerman. And now the Vice Minister for International Cooperation from the Netherlands, Mr. Stephen Collett. Ah. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Last year was marked by humanitarian catastrophes across the globe, from violence to conflict in Gaza, Ukraine and Sudan to natural disasters in Afghanistan, Syria, Turkey, Morocco and Libya. Do we still remember them? Many of them gone forgotten. And I don't even talk about those who are away from the cameras. Many more people suffered from those forgotten and neglected crises, like uh, my Benelux friends mentioned. If anything, 2023 has shown us just how indispensable the humanitarian relief effort provided by the European Union and its partners is. But it's not enough, and sadly, it will hardly ever be enough. And this is why we need each other, to make most out of every euro by working on innovation in delivery and planning, on prevention, and on narrowing the financing gap by finding partners we are currently less familiar with. The European Humanitarian Forum is in timely moment to do so, and I thank the European Commission and Belgium for bringing us together these days. The Netherlands will spend at least 535 million euros on humanitarian assistance this year. The vast majority of this funding is unearmarked, multi-annual and flexible. This way of funding can serve any crisis. It can be put to use ahead of crisis is immediately available upon the outbreak of a crisis and can be called upon after the most acute stage is over. 
it is simply most impactful. Let us therefore work together to increase this way of funding and overcome perceived hurdles, including lack of donor visibility and steer. But colleagues, we also need to work on improved delivery, and we require a so-called nexus approach, more leadership by the people who we serve with our efforts, and a seat at the decision table for local first-time responders. We need risk sharing and prioritization, and we require strong NGOs like our own Dutch Relief Alliance and the Netherlands Red Cross, alongside a principled and steadfast UN with UN agencies that are mandate-driven, progressive on reform, and transparent. We are the UN. And lastly, but not, certainly not least, we require respect for international humanitarian law. So I just echo the call by our host today to continue and strengthen our efforts to promote this. And let us walk our talk today and tomorrow to ensure access to principled, needs-based humanitarian assistance for the over 300 million people that will be, depend on our support this year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephen. And to hear Belgium's own pledge once more, please put your hands together for Minister Genet. Thank you. Now, very briefly, on what it's all about. We want, to be a diff we want to make a difference as Belgium by being a significant, consistent and principled donor. We focus our humanitarian aid on complex crises such as the Sahel, the Great Lakes region, the Palestinian territories and Syria. Many of these crises, as we have already mentioned, remain forgotten and remain underfunded. Belgium prioritizes quality funding, securing effective humanitarian action. 60% of our funding is core funding, are not earmarked. And that allows you, our humanitarian partners, to respond quickly to sudden emergencies. Multi-year flexible and predictable financing, such as SURF, the DREF, and the country-based pooled funds, has grown year after year. The total Belgian humanitarian budget for 2024 will be 190 million euros. With this funding, we prioritize on the protection of vulnerable people. And we will focus on local actors. They should be in the driver's seat of our humanitarian action. Increasing humanitarian budgets alone, as stated by Steven, is not the solution. We must keep on investing in development aid, especially in so-called fragile contexts, to address the root causes of fragility. The vast majority of our geographical priorities are forgotten crises. And in 2024, we will allocate at least 20% of our funding directly to the forgotten crisis. Moreover, Belgium allocates also geographically unearmarked funding. In total, 40% of our budget will go to forgotten crisis this year. And we strongly believe this should be the way forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we move swiftly on to the Minister of State for Development and International Partnerships for France, Ms. Chrysula Zakharopoulou. Bonjour, hein, Madame et Messieurs. On est en Europe, alors permettez-moi, je vais parler en français. Messieurs les commissaires, chers amis, et chère euh, Caroline, Madame et Messieurs, je suis très contente d'être ici aujourd'hui et pour vous retrouver à ce moment ici pour le Forum humanitaire européen. C'est la troisième édition, chère Caroline, des ans après soulagement sous présidence française au Conseil. Et vraiment, je souhaite te remercier d'y ancrer ce rendez-vous dans l'agenda européen. 
Comme vous savez bien, euh, la France elle est très engagée sur le procès du président Macron. Notre aide humanitaire a été multipliée par cinq depuis 2017. Et c'est un effort considérable. Avec plus de 800 millions d'engagements en 2023, la France est le troisième bailleur humanitaire européen et nous sommes parmi les dix premières bailleurs mondiaux et nous sommes vraiment fiers de ça. Cet engagement s'inscrit dans une stratégie plus large de remonter en puissance de notre dispositif d'action extérieure dans un monde qui se fracture, un monde où les crises se superposent, un monde tellement complexe avec beaucoup de crises, un monde où la brutalité s'accentue et les personnes, les hommes, les femmes, les enfants payent pour ça. Pour 2024, alors, nous nous appuyons sur une nouvelle stratégie humanitaire pour répondre aux besoins vitaux des populations. Avec euh, cette stratégie, nous stabilisons notre effort financier avec presque de 800 euh, 800 millions d'euros au niveau historiquement haut que nous avons attente. Nous concentrons nos efforts sur trois crises majeures. Tout d'abord, le conflit au Soudan. J'aimerais euh, vous annoncer que l'Union européenne, l'Allemagne et la France nous co-présiderons une conférence humanitaire internationale pour le Soudan et les pays voisins à Paris le 15 avril prochain. Un an après le déclenchement des hostilités et face à la catastrophe humanitaire, l'équipe Europe montre toute sa mobilisation pour que le Soudan ne devienne pas une crise oubliée. La deuxième crise, bien sûr, comme tous mes collègues, ils ont parlé, ce qui c'est à nos portes, c'est l'Ukraine, bien sûr. La France continuera à renforcer son soutien à Kiev avec un aide humanitaire française pour l'Ukraine à temps près de 300 millions. En lien droit avec nos partenaires, nous continuons de soutenir le peuple ukrainien qui résiste et endure toutes les conséquences de l'agression russe. Et enfin, bien sûr, l'aide humanitaire qui se déroule à Gaza. La situation humanitaire est intolérable et en ce sens, le fait immédiat et durable est nécessaire pour permettre l'arrivée de l'aide humanitaire à grande échelle. Bien sûr, nous condamnons aussi avec la plus grande fermeté les actes terroristes odieux commis pour les amants le 7 octobre et on demande la libération des otages. Voilà, mesdames et messieurs, la Syrie, l'Afghanistan, l'Est de la RDC, le Yémen, la France est toujours engagée. Je voulais dire, en finissant, que, euh, comme ma collègue allemande elle a souligné, à tant qu'Européenne, nous pouvons et nous devons maximiser notre efficacité et notre impact. Je vous remercie tous et je remercie en particulier euh, notre commissaire, Janice Lenarsit, pour son engagement. Tu es toujours là et je sais très bien qu'on peut compter sur toi et dans toute l'équipe Europe qui s'illustre chaque jour par la force de son action humanitaire. Merci beaucoup. Merci bien. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, and now we will hear from the Minister of for Foreign Affairs for the European Union and Cooperation for Spain, Mr. José Manuel Álvarez Bueno. Dear colleagues, members of the humanitarian community, organizers of the Forum Commissioner Lenarsic, as we speak, there are more than 110 active armed conflicts in the world. In countries like Ukraine, Sudan, Ethiopia, just to name a few, war is raging on Gaza with a terrible toll on civilian, mostly women and children. As I did last week during my tour to Jordan and Egypt, I want to call again for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire and the opening of all land crosses to Gaza. Humanitarian aid must enter Gaza unimpeded. The extension of military operation to Rafah would cause a humanitarian catastrophe. The civilian suffering must end. There has been enough violence. Humanitarian law must be respected. Spain has a firm humanitarian commitment towards Palestine, in particular towards UNRWA, 
through contribution amounting to 35 million euros since November and 23.5 million euros so far in 2024. We will continue funding and increasing our funding to UNRWA. And unfortunately, this is just the tip of the iceberg. In 2024, 300 million people are facing humanitarian needs and the funding gap stands at more than 35 billion US dollars. The situation is dire. We must act now. We need to do more. We need to do it better. And we need to do it together. First, the international community must increase its humanitarian funding. Last year, Spain's humanitarian budget peaked at almost 210 million euros, 40% more than in 2022. And this confirms a positive trend in line with the cooperation law that we enacted one year ago, which sets a target of 0.7 of our gross national income as official development assistance in 2030, 10% of which is devoted to humanitarian aid. This year, Spain's humanitarian budget will once again attain 210 million euros, the highest amount ever reached by the Spanish cooperation. But we need to do better through a better allocation of our humanitarian response and through flexible funding. And I'm happy to announce that as we increase our humanitarian budget, Spain will also boost its flexible funding in the coming years. Investing in anticipation can also allow us to cut future expenses and the humanitarian development peace nexus approach can be particularly useful in contexts where the three dimensions are present, such as the Sahel. And finally, what we do, we need to do it together as a collective effort, and that means enhancing our humanitarian diplomacy, including conflict prevention and resolution, and ensuring coherence when upholding international humanitarian law everywhere, in every conflict, in every continent. And that is why, one year ago, Spain adopted its first humanitarian diplomacy strategy, which focuses on the protection of the most vulnerable, with a particular focus on gender equality. Dear colleagues, you can count on Spain to keep working to provide a better future for the people in need all over the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. I enjoyed that rousing end. Um, next, on behalf of Croatia, the State Secretary for Political Affairs, Mr. Frano Matusic. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good morning. Croatia is actively engaged in addressing humanitarian crisis with a focus on supporting the most vulnerable, especially in the light of the increasing global needs driven by current geopolitical crisis and events. Our volume of official development assistance, ODA, has constantly grown and in 2022 has represented 0.19% of our gross national income, GNI, which is a significant increase from 0.13% from the previous years. Croatia has also been increasingly diversifying its development cooperation and humanitarian assistance, moving away from traditional forms of financing. In that context, we have just passed the new law on international development cooperation and humanitarian aid. Law expands the range of entities eligible to implement humanitarian and development projects, including civil society organizations and the private sector, and introduces modern financial instruments to facilitate their participation. Our focus remains on preserving humanitarian space, thus enabling safe and efficient humanitarian action in conflict areas and promoting respect of international humanitarian law. 
Croatia provided over 270 million euros in total to Ukraine, contributing to global efforts in allevi of alleviating negative consequences of Russia's brutal, unjustified war aggression. And we will continue to do so, especially in areas of humanitarian demining, physical and psychosocial rehabilitation of war veterans, and protection of women and children. At the same time, we kept our focus to unprecedented levels of destruction and suffering in Gaza or devastating consequences of natural disasters that struck Turkey and Syria, Libya and Morocco, as well as forgotten crises such as Uganda, Nigeria and Lebanon. And to close with concrete numbers, for the year 2024, Croatia allocated 6.7 million euros for humanitarian funding so far, but we expect the number to rise in the second half of this year. And you will surely agree with me that it would be best to end the speech and this forum by singing the song, Give Peace a Chance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and now, on behalf of Malta, the Minister for Foreign and European Affairs and Trade, Mr. Ian Borg. Is Mr. Borg here? Yes, great. Good morning. I'd like to begin by thanking the European Commission and the Belgium for jointly organizing this year's forum. At last year's European Humanitarian Forum, we acknowledged that humanitarian needs around the world were great, were, were higher than ever before. It was my hope today that one year later uh, we, we could meet under better circumstances. Regrettably, the world is facing a multitude of crises, not least climate change, a growing wave of political instability, and the most of all conflict. The ongoing uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine, the atrocious humanitarian situation in Gaza and many other emergency situations around the world have only compounded an already dire global situation. We must maintain focus on these crises, but remember that global humanitarian needs are larger than any one conflict. The proliferation of what are being termed neglected or forgotten crises serves as a stark reminder that the number of humanitarian emergencies worldwide are growing. Over the past 12 months, we have observed the rise in humanitarian needs accompanied by growing restrictions to humanitarian access. Such patterns demonstrate the urgency of reinforcing our common plea for rapid and unimpeded access to civilians in need. Humanitarian aid should never be politicized or instrumentalized. Safe and unimpeded access of humanitarian aid is the defining factor which ensures that our contributions today actually make a real difference on the ground. We take pride in the contribution that the EU and its member states have made to address humanitarian crises and humanitarian issues around the world. Year after year, we have witnessed the European Humanitarian Forum grow, which is a testament to our common commitment to keep humanitarian needs at the top of our agenda. I'm quite confident that the coming two days will feature several fruitful discussions which will feed into our joint efforts. Malta remains committed to make a meaningful contribution as part of the EU's overall effort one of the main elements guiding our foreign policy is the protection of civilians and humanitarian efforts, and we have already allocated more than 50% of Malta's official development assistance towards this end. Dear colleagues, so long as we act together, we can have an impact on the ground and improve the lives of millions of people who desperately depend on humanitarian aid to ensure their own survival. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Borg. And next, it is uh, Slovenia's Minister of Foreign and European Affairs, Ms. Tanja Fajon. Dear Commissioner Janus, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, 
If I were to summarize the remarks of my colleagues who have spoken before me, I would say or agree that we have to take action in order to stop complaining what to do about all humanitarian needs. War in Ukraine, forced displacement and famine in Gaza, destruction and disease in Syria, growing gang violence in an increasingly fragile Haiti, disease disasters and displacement crisis in various parts of Africa, escalating conflict, increasing humanitarian needs in Myanmar, and the list could go on. Slovenia has significantly increased its humanitarian aid in 2022. It more than doubled humanitarian funding compared to 2021, and in 2023 increased its funding by a further 50 percentage compared to 2022, and will continue doing so. In particular, Slovenia has substantially increased contributions to humanitarian needs in Gaza and for food security. Only in February this year, our government granted additional financial support to UNRWA. In particular, among those who suffer most in every war are children. They are deprived of food, health care and psychological support, education and much more. And this has to stop. Therefore, Slovenia has joined the call for action to scale up humanitarian assistance with a focus on Palestinian children to be launched today. The obstruction, blocking and hindrance of humanitarian aid is intolerable. And in addition to closing the humanitarian gap, there are many other complex challenges to address, which will require all the political wisdom, determination and preventive diplomacy skills that we possess. Slovenia's voice in the UN Security Council on the principle of upholding human dignity is loud and clear, regardless of the nature or location of the crisis. The protection of civilians in armed conflicts, safe and unimpeded humanitarian access, and the protection of humanitarian and medical personnel are the basic principles of international humanitarian law. Slovenia takes its role seriously as a donor and as an advocate. And we are glad to be part of a wider European effort to do even more. Humanity needs this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and as we move towards the end, uh, once again, a request to, for people to uh, please try and keep the time so that we can head on to the next session on time. Um, for the Czech Republic, the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Eduard Hulisius. Ladies and gentlemen, dear humanitarian actors, uh, I would like to welcome and thank for the opportunity to discuss uh, lessons and challenges related to the humanitarian assistance. Both key topics of the forum today, the funding gap and fragility, are of big importance across the humanitarian agenda and for all its actors. Uh, Czechia, which I represent, is a minor but efficient and flexible donor. As a rather forgotten donor, we have systematically focused our assistance on forgotten crises, hard to reach communities and complex fragilities. When I announced uh, that we will invest at least uh, 400 million Czech crowns, which represents 4% of budget of the Minister of Foreign Affairs in humanitarian response in 2024, you may think it's uh, not much or even not uh, enough. Of course, we make efforts to increase the humanitarian funding from year to year to get additional funding for new crises. But with so many crises and a major war raging in Europe, uh, in Ukraine, uh, it's uh, very difficult to get the money that are needed. Uh, that's why we are making efforts to create the highest possible value for those money we have in the humanitarian response, not least through enhanced localization, enhanced use of modern technologies, systematic coordination with the EU and UN partners to work in the world of uh, growing and complex fragility. 
One of our thematic priorities is disaster risk reduction and climate security. In view of the growing global fragility, we have to focus more and better on preparedness, prevention, adaptation and resilience. We also have to connect better the humanitarian and climate funding and humanitarian and climate actors and data. We need to connect the bottom-up localized approach with the top-bottom and regional approach. We should enhance the humanitarian diplomacy to enhance not only the humanitarian access, but also timely detecting and reduction of the root causes of so many humanitarian crises, instability, conflict, forced displacement. And this cannot be done only by you, by the humanitarian community alone. Uh, all humanitarian actors can enhance advocacy, outreach and coordination with political actors in this area. Uh, in view of Czechia, this can be a topic for the humanitarian forum discussions with positive outcomes for all those many in need everywhere. Thank you very much for your attention and good luck with the discussions today and tomorrow. Thank you very much, Mr. Hilusius. Uh, and now the Hungarian Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Mr. Peter Sciartu. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Unfortunately, it is not an exaggeration anymore to state that uh, we have been facing a global humanitarian catastrophe. The main root cause of this is that uh, we are experiencing the worst security situation putting into consideration the last couple decades. There are armed conflicts going on in around 30 countries and regions of the world, including the most serious ones in Ukraine and in the Gaza Strip. And on top of that threat of terror, uh, has been on its decade-long peak globally as well. I'm representing Hungary, a neighboring country to Ukraine. Therefore, we have been um, confronted with the tragic consequences of the war going on in our neighborhood directly. We have received more than a million refugees from Ukraine. We have been carrying out the largest humanitarian operation ever in the history of our country. There are 1,600 schools and kindergartens in Hungary where Ukrainian kids and students are being enrolled. And we provide all the uh, Ukrainian refugees with full and equal access to education and health care as well. And we are committed to continue our humanitarian activities in this regard as long as they will be necessary. But we all know that the real solution for this uh, tragic humanitarian situation can come with the war coming to its end. Therefore, we will increase our efforts in order to stand up for peace. When it comes to conflict in Gaza, we, con we consider it extremely important to make sure that the civilians are protected. And we do have to mobilize our support to Egypt, a country which has been bearing a lot of the burden. Therefore, Hungary has donated 200 ventilators and pharmaceutical assistance to the healthcare sector of Egypt. And threat of terror is one of the major root causes of forcing people to leave their homes. So therefore, we think there's a global responsibility to create safe and secure circumstances for everyone uh, to be able to have safe and secure life at home. Therefore, Hungary has established a regional development and humanitarian center for the Sahel in Chad. And we are also ready to deploy troops in order to help the fight against terror. All in all, our humanitarian uh, assistance has uh, increased to 70 million euros last year, and we are ready to continue to contribute to all our international efforts. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Mr. Sciato. And next for the Slovak Republic, um, the Minister of Foreign and European Affairs, Mr. Juraj Blanar. Ah. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Excellencies, dear Commissioner, dear colleagues, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to be here. I would like to thank European Commission and Belgium.
Presidency for the organizing this forum, which is a great opportunity to demonstrate EU's unwavering commitment to supporting effective humanitarian action around the world. Last year was extremely challenging. We have seen the outbreak of a new regulated conflict of massive scale resulting in uh, unprecedented humanitarian need and levels of humanitarian suffering. The war in Ukraine continues to cause death and destruction and millions of Ukraine, Ukrainians uh, require life saving humanitarian assistance. Ladies and gentlemen, we look also with the great concern at the increasingly worsening humanitarian situation in Gaza Strip. The number of civilian casualties is unacceptable. It is absolutely crucial to secure unhindered access for humanitarian aid. Economic insecurity, natural disasters and other crises have resulted in historic numbers of displaced people. Moreover, climate change contributes to the degradation of the security situation in several regions of the world and heavily affecting the most vulnerable. For 2024, Slovakia has allocated so far 2.5 million for a humanitarian assistance budget. In terms of regional priorities, our activities will be mainly concentrated in the Middle East region, where our project will focus on addressing the root causes of migration. Providing assistance to Ukraine has a special place in our priorities. This year, our activities will focus mainly on the provision of health care, and will also continue our activities in the field of humanitarian demining. In conclusion, I would like to highlight uh, that humanitarian aid cannot be entire response to crisis. It is uh, crucial to address the very core of the problem and to focus our effort on the root causes of humanitarian needs, which are the climate crisis, conflict, and economic instability. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. And now time for the Greek Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. George Gerapetritis. Thank you very much. I, I didn't deserve the applause because I'm not the Greek uh, minister. I'm just the permanent representative to the European Union. The minister had to rush to the Foreign Affairs Council, so I will read the statement on his behalf. He would have wished to start his intervention by paying tribute to the memory of the children victims of war as a modest expression of sorrow and respect. Over the last years, various conflicts and natural disasters have increased exponentially the numbers of people in need. The global humanitarian system's response has proved inadequate. The gap between the needs and the available resources has to be addressed urgently and collectively on the basis of the international community's solid commitments. Providing sufficient humanitarian finance will save lives and enhance peacekeeping efforts for sustainable development within the context of the humanitarian peace development nexus approach. Greece's position is based on the following parameters. First, not meeting the financing needs would mean to abandon the principle of leaving no one behind due to the lack of resources. Secondly, it is incumbent upon us to address the humanitarian needs with a commitment of the highest level of global political leadership. More precisely, it is important to focus on the root causes of humanitarian crisis with the aim of preventing and resolving conflicts, reducing fragility and building resilience. Thirdly, mobilizing additional funds demands the substantial involvement of the private sector by providing new solutions as well as the uh, private company's relevant skills mainly in logistics and insurance. Finally, improving the effectiveness of humanitarian assistance calls for donors and organizations to work in tandem in order to ensure flexibility, reciprocity and transparency. 
We commend DG ECHO for the recent initiative named EU Humanitarian Air Bridge. Through this initiative, we were able to enhance the delivery of our assistance towards Gaza and prompt more interaction between the European Commission and Member States towards an enhanced humanitarian Team Europe approach. We also encourage DG ECHO to extend this initiative to all other crises which remain in obscurity. In this context, we support the broadening of the donor's base, taking full advantage of the EU Hub initiative. This is how we delivered our aid in Gaza, following the earthquake, also following the earthquake in Syria and Turkey. Last but not least, I would like to announce that this year Greece plans to provide 1.7 million euros for humanitarian assistance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And the final in-person uh, pledger in this segment, uh, on behalf of Romania, the Secretary of State for European Affairs, Ms. Daniela Grigore Gitman. Distinguished ministers, dear colleagues, um, dear commissioners, uh, distinguished audience, I welcome the extended participation of the humanitarian community today. Making the European Humanitarian Forum a flagship event for another year in a row. The forum is particularly important at the time when the humanitarian situation worldwide is worse than ever, when people driven apart by rising inequality, escalating conflicts, and record-breaking climate shocks. Extremely worrisome, children are hugely affected by military conflicts, especially in Gaza. This is why Romania decided to support the emergency call for action launched by the Commission, Commissioner Lenarchik, and the Belgian Presidency of the EU Council. Moreover, Romania stands ready to receive the wounded children uh, from Palestine in our hospitals uh, to the best of our capacity. It is essential to ensure also that life-saving aid reaches those in need and that civilians are better protected. With needs at all-time high and limited resources, we have to be creative and find innovative common solutions while fighting the negative polarization tendencies. I would like to briefly highlight Romania's vision on what can be done more. First, we need to be flexible and adapt easily to the ever-changing situation while expecting the worst in terms of increasing needs. Romania has a swift needs-balanced approach for its response to humanitarian crisis and a flexible modus operandi that has enabled efficient reaction and rapid mobilization of in-kind and financial aid in diverse situations. Most recently, last week, Romania sent additional assistance consisting in urgently needed medical equipment for the field hospital on the, of the Hashemite uh, Kingdom of Jordan in Gaza in support of the affected civilian population. Last year, Romania financed humanitarian intervention amounting to 25% of its international and national ODA spending, an equivalent of 113 million euro. Secondly, we need to work collectively in order to make a difference in terms of funding, advocacy, or humanitarian diplomacy. The Team Europe approach is an already well-tested practice that should be extended globally by involving more and more like-minded partners and donors from outside the EU. I appreciate the EU civil protection mechanism and the European humanitarian response capacity, both having successfully ensured coherent actions of the member states, most recently in response to the crisis in Gaza, where Romania sent 125 tons of essential shelter items through the humanitarian air bridge operation. This year, Romania focused on extending the network of its partnership in Africa and signed agreements with several African partners in the field of civil protection and management of emergency situations. Moreover, we have created the Fund for the Future of Africa through education, peace and development and allocated 70% of the MFA ODA budget to projects under this fund. 
In response to the global food crisis, deepened by the dire consequences of Russia's illegal war against Ukraine, Romania facilitated so far the transit of over 38 million tons of Ukrainian grain. Our projects aim at increasing resilience to energy and food crisis, while 10% of the Romanian MFA ODA budget was dedicated to preparedness and disaster risk reduction projects. For 2024, Romania remains committed to supporting global efforts on addressing the humanitarian needs and build effective partnerships to better deliver on our aid. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. And now the representative from Bulgaria. Here we go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Genka Gyurgieva, Director General for Global Affairs. As you probably know from local Bulgarian news, my minister is uh, uh, engaged in uh, internal political talks for a new government. Um, allow me first to thank the European Commission and the Belgian Presidency for organizing the third edition of the European Humanitarian Forum. And um, we should still keep in mind that more than 350 million people around the world need humanitarian assistance as we speak in order to survive due to armed conflicts, protracted crises, human rights violations and natural disasters. In 2024, Bulgaria remains committed with its humanitarian assistance to the most vulnerable, such as the refugees, women, children, people with disabilities, we give priority consideration to the emergency responses to conflicts, natural disasters, as well as to protracted and often forgotten humanitarian crises. Around 20% of our overall budget for development cooperation this year is dedicated to humanitarian aid. Geographical priorities, of course, Ukraine, Palestine, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, Iraq. In 2024, Bulgaria is committed to provide flexible humanitarian funding also to OCA-managed country-based port funds for Ukraine, Afghanistan, and Yemen. And um, as a kind of a closing, the most effective way to respond to the current complex humanitarian crisis is, of course, to reduce the level of humanitarian needs. We need to stay focused on strengthening the nexus between the humanitarian assistance, development aid, and peace-building activities. A reinforced humanitarian diplomacy is crucial for preventing crisis, resolving conflicts, and supporting humanitarian operations. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. And to bring this part of the morning to an official close, once more, please um, put your hands together for Commissioner Lenarchic. Thank you. I thank everyone for their statements and in particular for the pledges. The figures are now in. In addition to those who generously and uh, courageously, I would say, pledged on this stage, we have also received in writing the amounts from other member states not present here with us today. And the total of those pledges that you have not heard from this stage is 1.7 billion euro, which brings the total pledged by the EU and its member states to 7.7 .7 billion euros for humanitarian aid. I think, I think this is a solid amount. I think uh, with this Europe has um, demonstrated its continued commitment to the humanitarian cause across the world. Uh, but it could be better. And actually, I expect that it will get better because this is initial, initial allocation and it is expected to grow. And that would also be in line with the expectations of the European citizens, our own citizens, who in nearly 90% of cases believe the EU should sustain or increase existing levels of humanitarian funding. That means that Europeans support our actions, 
Europeans expect us to deliver, and I think we should meet their expectations. Thank you all, and this opening session is hereby closed. Yes, brilliant. Um, that brings this um, part of the morning to a close. Sessions will start on the dot at 11 o'clock. So please use this time to grab a coffee, tea, biscuit and head to your session rooms. Thank you all for listening. I wish you a productive forum.
Good morning, everyone. Please take your seats. Thank you so much for being here for this important and timely panel discussion addressing the catastrophic humanitarian situation in Gaza. It's a grim challenge and a conundrum that's not just facing humanitarian actors, but is actually, as you know, preoccupying the whole world. My name is Anya Sitharam. I'm a former BBC World News presenter. I now work as a documentary producer and conference host. And in my documentary producing, I've worked with a lot of humanitarian agencies to help me get access into a number of countries. Before we continue, I just wanted to remind you that we are going to be using Slido for the Q&A, which after our panel discussion, we'll be inviting you, the audience. Uh, you can see the code on the screen, so if you want to get onto Slido now and register, you have to put your name as well, so your name will come up on the questions. And we'll also take questions from the floor. And we also have interpretation in English, French, and Spanish. If you, go, if you need a headset and you go to your channel, one is what's going on here on the stage, two is English, three is French, um, yeah, and four is Spanish, I think. So before I introduce our very distinguished panel, I just wanted to remind you of some facts. According to the Integrated Food Security Classification, IPC, report, which was published in December, 100% of people in Gaza are estimated to be acutely food insecure, while a quarter of its population faces catastrophic hunger and starvation. And that is unprecedented. No IPC report anywhere in the world has ever recorded such low levels of food insecurity. And while this panel discussion is going on, we're going to be getting the results of a new report. And obviously, as you know, things haven't got any better. So we will wait to see what the new report says. And furthermore, hospitals in Gaza that managed to accommodate patients under degraded conditions face acute shortages, not just in medicines, but also staff and other supplies. And almost the entire population of Gaza is dependent on humanitarian assistance. The community is highly, the humanitarian community is highly constrained on what it can do. I think you all know that. So to discuss what's needed to overcome these obstacles and deliver desperately needed food and medicines and supplies, let me welcome our panel. I'll go through the lineup of people sitting here. We have Faris Aruri, Director of the Association of International Development Agencies, IDA. We also have Marwan Jalali, Director General of the Palestinian Red, Cross Society, Red Crescent Society, IPRCS. And we have Natalie Bukli, Deputy Commissioner General for Program and Partnerships, UNRWA. We have Minister Caroline Genet, who is the Minister of Development, Cooperation and of Major Cities in Belgium. And finally, at the end, we have Ted Chaiban, Deputy Executive Director, UNICEF. So I'm going to begin um, by asking the panelists some questions. It'll be sort of interview style, and then we'll open it up to the floor. So first of all, um, I'd like to invite uh, Faris Aruri from IDA to uh, set the scene and also describe the challenges facing the humanitarian sector. In particular, what are the access challenges for INGOs operating in Gaza? Hello and good afternoon. Uh, well, the main thing, the first elephant in the room, is ceasefire. Uh, without a ceasefire, uh, any presence on the ground would still be inadequate and impossible to deliver. We cannot uh, literally feed people so they would die on a full stomach. Uh, so, uh, in order to provide proper access, not only for INGOs, but for all humanitarian actors, we need to start with a full and permanent uh, ceasefire. 
the second point, which has already been also addressed in the uh, morning speeches, is access of humanitarian aid. Uh, we cannot, again, uh, this crisis is uh, politically engineered. Uh, aid is being politically prevented from entering uh, Gaza, which I think to a large extent is, not, is unprecedented in um, modern history at least. Thousands of trucks are uh, waiting at different borders, but mainly in, uh, in Egypt. Within Gaza as well, uh, even when we, the scarce amount of aid that all humanitarian actors uh, manage to bring in is also limited to Rafah. We are not allowed or we're not enabled to uh, provide aid outside of Rafah. Uh, more than almost 80% of INGOs, members of AIDA, report that they are constrained to the Rafah uh, governorate. Only three of our organizations were able to actually access what is uh, now referred to as the uh, north of, uh, of Gaza. And this is mainly due to the uh, lack of uh, you know, respect uh, to the humanitarian notification system. We have, I think, all heard of uh, aid convoys being uh, held, targeted, and prevented, uh, prevented entry. But also what we haven't heard of is that almost 70% of requests to access the north are not, uh, uh, are not fulfilled. And finally, of course, comes the uh, security on the ground, the, the ambiguity uh, and the inability to provide security for our own staff, both national and expat, uh, on, on the ground limits our ability to, uh, to respond. And of course, the issues of connectivity and telecom and logistics, but all that can be solved, again, once we have a proper ceasefire and once we have proper access. Okay, so ceasefire and access, those are your two main messages. But what about your local um, partners on the ground that you work with? For uh, local partners, um, most Palestinian national NGOs, very well uh, equipped, very uh, competent, work in partnership with international actors. So either uh, INGOs or uh, uh, other international uh, 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 organizations and we provide support, we work in tandem, uh, let's say. And uh, for the, 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 the first point, to empower national NGOs would be to empower the, uh, the international presence so we can provide the aid that then the national NGOs uh, can uh, provide as local partners are dependent to a large extent on that uh, 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 issue. And also without addressing the issues that we just highlighted before as well, you know, uh, uh, this, you know they, they face the same reality practically or even worse conditions than us as, uh, as internationals. Uh, and the last point is that, uh, you know, we need, everyone needs to scale up, locals and internationals. But for that to happen, we need resources, and not only aid, but also hu human resources. Um, national NGOs have national uh, staff. International NGOs are mostly uh, uh, dependent on national staff. And with almost 70% of our staff reporting as uh, not only as IDPs, but also shelterless. So they're not even, you know, how can you ask them to show up for work when they are uh, shelterless. So again, the challenge is, is humongous and we need to uh, force an environment that allows uh, the humanitarian sector at large to operate. Thank you. And I'm, I like the, the way you've used that word humongous. I mean, that really is sort of quite mind boggling. Um, but humanitarian agencies often operate in war zones. Um, what about the dangers faced by the people on the ground there and the INGOs? How do they differ from other places? Each uh, conflict is unique, I would say, you know, each has its specificities. Uh, but for Gaza, again, you know, uh, the fact that you have thousands of trucks laying in, uh, uh, just across, across the fence, you know, you see them. It's not even, they're not uh, uh, tens of kilometers away, they're just across the fence and they're, and they're not able to, uh, to come in. Then even the INGOs or the humanitarian actors at large inability to bring in equipment. You know, uh, we cannot have uh, to bring in cars. We cannot bring in PPE equipment, uh, protection equipment. We're unable to bring in even uh, radio uh, devices to communicate. So practically we can communicate only, and I think my colleagues can testify to it, in very limited uh, rooms that are lucky, have luckily maintained certain uh, uh, telecom. The fact that uh, all INGO workers ha uh, have either 
user has seen their visas expire in the past six months, especially since February, when uh, the blanket renewal expired, or we'll, we'll see them expire in the coming uh, few weeks is also uh, mind-boggling. You know, from one side, our national staff are not uh, in Gaza are IDPs. Our national staff in Jerusalem are not allowed into Jerusalem since October 7th as well. There was a full ban on uh, uh, Palestinians from the West Bank access to Jerusalem. And now our expat staff are, uh, are not allowed in. And to add to it also the access to Gaza, you know, you, you, to support the, uh, uh, the national staff in Gaza, we need to send expat staff. But to send expat staff is a very complex uh, process due to the, from one side, the lack of security, but also the complex arrangements that are required where we are, there are only two days per week where we can uh, send in or out uh, uh, staff. And again, it has to be pre-coordinated a week ahead. There's no, there are no SOPs for medivacs or to evacuate even casualties, which also hinders the ability of INGOs uh, to bring in staff. And finally, we are not also allowed to bring in national staff from the West Bank to Gaza. Uh, which so practically our national colleagues and the few expats that we were able to send are left uh, to fight all that uh, all this uh, let's say uh, uh, war against famine uh, uh, single-handedly which is impossible thank you very much um, Marwan Jelani we uh, from the PRCS you um, we had a very vivid testimony there and huge frustrations from uh, Faris but from your perspective can you also describe the latest situation on the ground. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, let me start by thanking ECO and Belgium government for, for hosting this meeting and for inviting us. Uh, let me maybe dedicate this short intervention to what we call the local actors, to what I call in this situation the local heroes. Those who from day one have been there, and today, 165th day, have not had a single hour of break. They do not have the luxury to go out and come back. They do not have a luxury to go to their homes, to their families. Their families are displaced as everybody else in Gaza. One anecdote, when we had our hospital in Gaza City, Al-Quds Hospital, was besieged for almost three weeks. The tanks were surrounding it. Snipers were around it. We had five people killed from inside the hospital. Whoever moves uh, across a window get killed. When finally uh, we were forced to evacuate, we had our colleagues move to Khan Yunis, to another hospital which we have there, Al-Amal Hospital, and our headquarters uh, in, in Khan Yunis. So I called the, the, the senior manager there and I, and I asked him, take a couple of days, go, go to your family because they've been under siege. And he told me, where? My family is in a school and I don't know where they are. And then by coincidence, uh, another colleague told him, well, I saw your daughter and her husband in the street. He didn't know even where they are. So that's, that's the situation of the local heroes. The local heroes, which include the Ministry of Health, and I know, unfortunately, the media tries to label. I've never heard that any, min any health workers, professional health workers, are labeled with a political party. You don't call the British National Health Service the Conservative Health Service or the Labour. They are professional doctors, nurses, volunteers, who, who have been there, who have been working for decades. And again, we lost more than 360 people from the medical teams, more than 160 people from the civil defense workers. We as PRCS, we lost 15 of our staff and volunteers. 13 of them were on duty to save lives, to, to to cater for injured people, a mission which was coordinated, which was informed to the Israeli authorities with the coordinates, with the, with the ID numbers of the people who are going there and with the location. And yet, they were all, 13 of them, targeted and killed. 
So the situation is, and I'm sure we all feel the same way, is heartbreaking. Every day you wake up to the news and everybody as we are in Gaza more, more so is when this will this end? Will I wake up tomorrow and be alive? Will I wake up tomorrow and be with my family, etc.? So today we woke up to yet another, another tragic news. The attack on Al-Shifa Hospital, again, after it's been bombarded, surrounded, everybody was kicked. Still the director of Al-Shifa Hospital is, is in detention. We have three of our colleagues are also in detention. Again, they are in detention, they were detained when they were on mission with WHO, and they were given, the Israelis were given their names, their ID numbers, what they were going, they were going to Al Amal Hospital to evacuate the wounded, together with the WHO. On their way back, they were stopped, they were asked to go down, stripped of their clothes, together with the patients who, those patients who can walk, and then, Three of them were detained. They were kept until after midnight. The other, these are the heroes, the local heroes, the professionals, PSA staff, ANRWA staff, those local staff who again, the same, lost their family members. Many of them have been, have been killed while serving and they still do serve. We have a couple of our ambulance uh, uh, staff and volunteers were injured. I was on the phone with them in Gaza the first two months, almost every minute. So they, they go to the hospital, they get treated, the next hour they are back on duty. And that's the kind of dedication, that's the kind of heroes. Those are the people who are working First and foremost, this dedication stems from the care for the people, their people. They are part of this community. They are uh, uh, the ones who feel responsible and, and who do not think of anything else except uh, to do their duties. PICS, in the first instance, when the Israeli ground invasion took place, third week of December, I think, our clinic and our EMS center in Jabalia was destroyed. We did not evacuate. We refused to evacuate. And still till today, our colleagues in Jabalia in northern Gaza are still, are still there. They moved from our center, which was destroyed, to the Anirwa clinic in Jabalia. Then Anirwa clinic was, was hit. They moved to the Ma'madani hospital in Jabalia. Today they are scattered around because the, the ambulances cannot move and, and so they have to be, we have about, we have 20 of our ambulances destroyed. In total, 126 ambulances in the whole Gaza Strip have been destroyed. So they're trying uh, to adapt. I will not bore you with the statistics. This goes beyond the statistics. We all know this is unprecedented. This is, we've been say, saying from day one, we are seeing a genocide, a humanitarian catastrophe unfolding before our eyes. And as Mr. Borrell said, humanitarians can do so much, but the burden is on the political officials, on governments to stop this. Thank you very much, I'll stop here. Thank you. I'll just come back with a very brief question then. Um, you outline the risks, the difficulties, um, the dangers for the volunteers and the, the PRCS staff working there. Can you see a day when they wouldn't be able to operate there or they just wouldn't want to work there given the conditions they're in? I think look, it's, I mean, it is, it is maybe a, a, the duty of the Red Cross, Red Crescent societies, the volunteers, all humanitarian workers at last to, to be able to help and they understand they are always at risk and they do. 
But of course, this situation is unprecedented. This situation, we've never seen something like this. When you are, you know, you're going on a mission and you are going to be targeted, deliberately targeting. And you have, unfortunately, a good chance that you will be killed, but still you are going. We have accompanied the United Nations, and here I must say that we have collaborated so well, we have worked, we, we, uh, we have seen how the United Nations, all the agency, quite honestly, in, in, our, in our mission, because we are also a major health organization, we work so well with WHO, with UNICEF, with UNRWA, with WFP, and we have been coordinated, coordinating our mission. And as the major local actor, we, we are responsible for evacuating the, the medical evacuees from the hospitals to Rafah. We were accompanying, uh, we were accompanied by UN, OCHA and, and others and WHO to take assistance to the north because again, we were also on top of what we do. We were given the huge burden of being responsible, the national Palestinian entity responsible for receiving the aid through Rafah and distributing it to the, uh, to the different actors. And we were, we were collaborating with and around this. So I think there is, there is no question that our colleagues, you know, I'll give just one anecdote. Those people, we have 30 volunteers in Jabalia, staff and volunteers. Nobody told them to stay. Nobody told them from management to go from the destroyed clinic, PRCS clinic to Anarwa school or uh, uh, clinic or to the Baptist hospital. They themselves took the initiative, they look at the situation and they acted accordingly out of this humanitarian uh, duty to serve and to remain with, uh, with their people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to move on to Natalie uh, Bukli now uh, from UNRWA. Um, you visited Gaza a couple of weeks ago, um, but I want to broaden it slightly as well. So how can we better work with local and international partners to improve humanitarian access to Gaza? Uh, thank you very much, Anya. Indeed, um, what I might want to do is um, give my impressions of Gaza because I was there a couple of weeks ago and I think that's useful context to then broaden and answer your question. What really struck me there is the extent, the scale and the consequences of the mass displacement. I mean, Gaza is 2.1 million. It's roughly the population of Brussels and greater area. We've got 1.7 million people displaced, 1.4 million in Rafah, which is a town which accommodated 280,000 people, not more, before, and one million of which are in UNRWA facilities. And so beyond, you know, people talked about the fear, the hunger, the insecurity, but what I saw as well, and what I haven't heard so far here, and I want to put it here on the stage, is the unfolding health and sanitation and environmental crisis that is also unfolding or happening in Gaza uh, today. People, I've seen people, women in particular, uh, who bear the brunt of the crisis, live in squalid conditions. Um, there's an offensive smell in Rafa uh, along the sea because there's no sewage system anymore. Um, it's open sewage, it's, there's no solid waste collection. People are basically stacked on top of each other, um, living in undignified conditions. And that for women is also paying a heavy price, no privacy, no dignity for anybody. Um, really. So I visited shelters. Um, on average, it's 30,000 people in each shelter, um, uh, which UNRWA is hosting. I was unable to move around the shelter. It was just so packed. And people had obviously demands, you know, um, hunger, you know, food, medicine. Um, there's on average 5,500 people for one shower. 888 people for one toilet. So how can you live in these conditions? It's very difficult. I also visited the East Rafa distribution center, which used to work very well. It's a flower distribution center of UNRWA, and it was hit only three, four days ago. So talking about the toll that this is taking, UNRWA has already lost 168 uh, staff members. Um, 3,500 staff members are still working every day. And it is what you are saying, uh, Marwan. They get up every day, they displace themselves, their families have been 
um, injured or lost, um, they've lost family members, but they still come to work. There's a general breakdown of law and order. This was talked about as well. And um, very, very difficult, if not impossible, to go to the north. And there's another concept that I haven't heard here, or I've, he I've heard it um, just mentioned by one minister, it's leaving no one behind. This is a key um, goal of the UN, and I don't think we're able to actually leave no one behind in Gaza at the moment. So against that context, now let me get to your question. And as I said, UNRWA really remains the backbone of the humanitarian operations um, in Gaza. It contributes all of its assets in support of other partners on the ground, from the reception to the storage to the distribution of aid, um, the tracking, the reporting, the logistics, the fuel, the vehicles, the accommodation, and the coordination with the Israeli authorities, of course. Um, the CLA and COGAT is done by, by UNRWA. And the response is really centered around the UNRWA shelters or the vicinity of these shelters. We already have excellent partnerships, I have to say, with uh, colleagues from the UN. UNICEF is here. Over 53,000 children are vaccinated since January. It's also thanks to UNICEF and the vaccines and the vaccinations are taking place in UNRWA health centers because we still have seven health centers operating, including um, in Rafa, two of them. Um, WHO, of course, uh, I should mention, uh, WFP for the food, IOM for the shelters. We have these partnerships in place, including also with the World um, Central Kitchen that has made the news recently, and uh, for their community kitchen, we work with them, and UNOPS for the fuel. Now, how do we work better? Well, we would scale up and we would have much larger and bigger partnership if the environment for us to have, have more food coming into Gaza, more aid coming into Gaza, and then be able to distribute it if that environment was enabled. At the moment, it is very difficult to operate. So there are constraints. Um, the, it takes, uh, I, I went to the crossing and I saw myself, I jumped on the blue line and I saw what you describe, which is aid is just there. We call it sleeping aid in Gaza. But the trickle, I think on average, um, is it 99 trucks that are coming in a day, is a trickle of aid. So all the constraints around getting the aid in need to be eased. We need to have more stable communication, um, internet, you know, all of this has broken down. There's no electricity in Gaza and more crossing points. If crossing points were open, then we would be able to have more aid. With more aid coming in, then if there was a ceasefire and if the enabling environment, more security within Gaza was also assured, then we would be able to do more together with our partners. Uh, we would call also on international media to be allowed uh, access uh, into Gaza, respect for international humanitarian law, but I think uh, the minister is going to talk about it. Private sector resumption um, and uh, predictable funding for all and of course the release of hostages. I mean, this is something that everybody wants as well. Talk about uh, just interesting. Want to pick up that thing about private sector? I mean, those are the local actors. What what is the impact on the people that are working with you? That, that private sector. What is the impact of on the private sector? Those local Be actors. Before the war, there were about 500 trucks that used to come in into into Gaza, and they are mostly private sector, mostly commercial goods. This has completely um, broken down. Obviously, today. Um, it's, it's aid that comes in. How long is this population going to rely on aid? The commercial sector needs to kick up again, like small shops, I'm not talking, you know, stalls, just, just to try. But the conditions are not there yeah. because it's so insecure. How do you actually even launch a humanitarian operation under constant bombardment? So it, it's, everything you say is sort of provokes more questions. It's a sort of circular um, incredibly frustrating. But I just wanted to ask you a, another question um, about UNRWA. Um, we've heard that some countries, including Australia, Canada and Sweden, have now resumed funding. But what impact has the funding freeze had on you? Yes, um, thank you. And we thank the, all the countries that resumed and the countries that never left us and uh, continue to support us and even scaled up actually their pledges and we heard from Spain, Portugal, Malta, Slovenia and Ireland. Um, so thank you. We still have 13 countries though um, who have um, not made a decision as to whether to resume or not and the impact of that is 365 million dollars that um, we are unable to account for. Now uh, 
you know, the current state of affairs will be okay doing our operations until the end of April, perhaps beginning of May. But how do you plan? I mean, you know, and the, we shouldn't be placed in this situation today when there's a humanitarian crisis unfolding. And so, you know, it has impact on our procurement, it has impact on staff morale, it has impact on our planning, on the pipeline. So we really call on the resumption of funding. But it's not only in Gaza, the impact of the freezes or pauses or suspension is felt and will be felt um, if uh, countries do not resume across the region in all the five fields of operations where we operate, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Jordan. And this is affecting primarily, and I come back to it, the health situation. We have hundreds of thousands of Palestine refugees, whether in Jordan, in Syria or Lebanon, who will not be able to access the health facilities. In Jordan, it's also 100,000 children who may not be able to go to an UNRWA school. So it has a wider impact than just Gaza. Thank you very much. And anyway, as you said, you are responsible, UNRWA, you're the backbone. So without the backbone, yes. yeah. We've got 13,000 staff yeah. on the ground. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to bring in uh, Minister Karine Genet now. Um, I want to take it a step further now, sort of move the conversation on uh, not just to the impact on the ground and, and hearing sort of first-hand accounts. Um, in January, the International Court of Justice ordered Israel to enable the provision of basic services and humanitarian assistance. And the Belgian Prime Minister is reported to have said tactics of starvation are inadmissible. So how can we ensure an adherence to international human law by all parties in the conflict? Yeah, thank you so much. First of all, I'd like to pay tribute to uh, my three colleagues here because uh, as you rightly stated, the through heroes, they are on the ground. And I think it's important that they are not just numbers. It's not only 32,000 people killed, it's families, it's not only famine or starvation as a weapon of war, it's about international humanitarian principles. And we have to adhere to these principles as international community. And for me as a, as a Belgian minister and, and being in the presidency um, of the European Council, I think it's so important that when we say that we are in support of international law, that we say that a child that is killed by a Russian mine in the Donbass is as important as a child being starved in Gaza. And we should apply the same rules. If not, we lose our credibility and our adherence to the international humanitarian principles. Also in a war, there are rules. And that's why it's so important that the ICG provisional measures are respected. It wasn't nothing. We have to prevent commonly a genocide. We have to make sure that humanitarian aid is accessible, that it reaches the people in need. And it's the highest international court that's just, that judged so. So when you look into the situation on the ground, you can only be depressed because humanitarian aid has not been stepped up since the ruling of the ICG. It has been stepped down even. When we say we need 500 trucks each day and we see only 98 coming in, well, we're not matching the expectations. When we have to rely on airdrops or sea corridors while trucks are piling up at the border, we are leaving people behind. And Belgium will intervene in the ICJ court proceeding. And I think it's important that we do so. We don't take sides. We're just in support of humans, people who are victims of extremist regimes. Hamas being in a terrorist organization attacking innocent civilians, partying, sleeping, but also an Israeli government influenced by extreme right-wing ministers not respecting anything of what we abide by as international community. And it's innocent civilians who are the victims. So I think when we want to have international law respected, all of our countries, 
all of our governments should intervene because we have to prevent the genocide and we have to prevent starvation. And that's why the Belgian government decided to do so. Of course, we have to call for a ceasefire. If not, it will only worsen and worsen and worsen, only more innocent victims and only more hatred and, and, and grudge will be installed for generations. Third thing, accountability. And then we come back to international law. I think we need more transparency on the ground. It's not only humanitarian workers who are targeted and my condolences to, to all the families and to the organizations and, and the staff that, that has been killed, but it's also journalists. There is no respect for transparency in this situation. And I know in every war, the truth is one of the first victims, but this situation is a propaganda war as well. And we should stay with the facts, we should overcome what the propaganda that has been waged by the two parties. But about accountability, Belgium was one of the first um, countries as well to pledge another 5 million euros to the ICC. I think it's important that proceedings um, are um, prepared and that accountability can come to the forefront once that more access is secured. I'd like to underline as well that more humanitarian access, of course, is needed. And there are so many border crossings that still are totally closed. So we have Eres in the north. Please open it up. 400,000 people are in risk of starvation, famine. And there is a border crossing just where these people are stuck. We have a port, the port of Ashdod. A lot of humanitarian aid is stuck. So please allow more humanitarian goods to come in. And what can we do? I think we can be principled as international community. And we have to speak with one voice. And as far as we are concerned, also in the European Union, we speak Mm, not so much with one voice. We could do better and we are improving, but still, I think we have to be principled. If not, we will be accused of uh, using double standards. With Belgium uh, as the presidency at the moment, sitting at the presidency of the council, can you exert any influence to try and encourage well, your fellow I think EU it's countries. important that, uh, that we take principled positions. Um, what's wrong by promoting international law, international humanitarian law, by stating the facts as they are, um, by talking to both sides, but in a principled manner, uh, in accordance to international law. And I think we should bring all measures to the table Political measures, of course, we need negotiations on a two-state solution. And if I'm concerned, I think when we talk about a two-state solution, well, we've recognized the state of Israel, it's there. I think we have to recognize the state of Palestine as well. On the other hand, we have to be principled. We have relations with Israel as well. We have an association agreement. We have uh, an article two in the agreement that states, well, if one of the parties, Europe or Israel, intend not to respect the human rights clause, maybe we should go into it. Maybe we should review that. And maybe that's something the European Commission can do. And it is on the table of the Foreign Affairs Council ongoing at this moment. So I think the whole range of political, diplomatic um, measures should be under scrutiny because this violence must stop. Thank you very much for that.
So I'd like to move on now to Ted Chaiban, thank you. Uh, and you're overseeing UNICEF's operation in Gaza. Um, we heard from Natalie about the impact on women, um, but we know that 70% of the 31,000 people killed are women and children. But from a UNICEF point of view, what is the impact of the delays in humanitarian aid on children? Th thank you, Anya, and uh, thank you for having us here. Uh, the, the delay of humanitarian assistance on children and that impact uh, is nothing short of horrendous. Uh, you, you mentioned the overall uh, numbers of people killed. Uh, of that number, 13,450, over 13,450 uh, children have been reportedly killed. That's an unprecedented uh, number, which is a stain on our consciousness and a stain on our humanity. Uh, 33 Israeli children have also died. Uh, 13,450 Palestinian children, 33 Israeli children. Um, and now what we're seeing is children dying of malnutrition and dehydration, which is a, a slow, painful death where your organs shut down. We know of 23 children uh, in the north of the Gaza Strip, according to reports uh, that we've received from hospitals that have died due to malnutrition and dehydration. And that would be the tip of the iceberg. Those are the children who actually got to the hospital, not the children who have died silently at home or in communities when they didn't get to the hospital. Uh, and uh, this just goes to show what lack of access, what uh, insufficient humanitarian assistance leads to. Um, UNICEF did a survey uh, of malnutrition levels in Gaza. As you referenced, the IPC report will be out in 12 minutes. Um, and that survey showed that we have 31% of the children in the north of Gaza, or one in every three children that's acutely malnourished. Uh, that's up from 15% in January, which shows you how quickly the situation is deteriorating. And if you don't treat the child that's acutely malnourished, they basically have a 40% chance of dying. And as I said, it's a painful, slow death. So we, we now have the, the, the reality of death due to bombing, death due to shelling, uh, now being compounded by death due to hunger, death due to malnutrition, death due to disease. What are you hearing about what they are actually eating? Is it just they're not eating or are they eating stuff which doesn't give them any nutrition? So 100% uh, uh, of the population in uh, of the, of the population in Gaza is not eating enough. And that's particularly acute in the north of the, of the Strip, where, again, there's been barriers to access. Uh, um, and then there's the issues around the uh, types of food and the variety of food that is uh, available. But the, 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 the point I want to make is, uh, while you have a 31% rate of acute malnutrition in the north of the Strip, it's at 8%, which is high, but manageable and below the threshold level on the border with Rafa. Because there you've got better access to humanitarian assistance and some commercial trucks. And that just goes to show that this is something that can be addressed if access is opened up, if the conditions for humanitarian and commercial traffic into the Strip are allowed uh, to happen. Um, and uh, it goes to show that there, you can make a difference. Organizations like the international NGOs, Palestinian Red Cross, uh, Red Crescent Society, UNRWA, UNICEF, WHO, uh, WFP, we're on the ground. We've got 35 colleagues from UNICEF on the ground currently who are working on these issues, trying to get the assistance in, and it must be allowed to go in. And, okay, it must be allowed to go in, so let me just put you on the spot. What do you think should be done to allow them to go in? I mean, firstly, and let me, let me just join Ferris, Marwan, Nathalie, and, and, and the minister. 
in, in basically summarizing what they've said. I mean, firstly, is a ceasefire. Uh, an attack on Rafa would have consequences beyond the manageable. I mean, we're talking about 13,450 Palestinian children killed uh, as of now. I don't want to contemplate what it looks like, an attack on, on, on Rafa. Uh, and make it part, you know, it has to be part of a deal where hostages come home too. There's two children, one in four, who are still being held hostage. They need to be home with their families as well. That's all part of a, an arrangement around the ceasefire. Second uh, uh, is access through more points. Uh, Minister Genes mentioned uh, Eretz, Carney needs to be opened up, uh, and you need to have access to commercial trucks. As Natalie said, there were 500 trucks uh, before uh, the war started on 7th of October. We've had an average of between 98 and 110 uh, uh, since then. That's 20% of what's needed to sustain the population. Uh, and there's absolutely no reason why commercial trucks can't be part of the equation. Third um, is uh, to stop uh, uh, delaying the entry of so-called dual-use supplies into the Strip. Um, we've had PVC water pipes to repair water systems that took four months to come in. And we still can't get the, the water taps, the, the small metal bends, to be able to connect water systems so that people can have access to drinking water, which we take for granted uh, every day. Uh, and then uh, uh, lastly, uh, as you've pointed out, uh, and others have pointed out, sea and air access are welcome, but they're not a substitute for road access. There needs to be use of the border road so that we can get into the north of the strip. Um, uh, there needs to be faster inspections at both uh, Rafa and Kerem Shalom uh, so that the population uh, can get the support it needs. This is a, a deliberate uh, squeezing of humanitarian space in a manner than in my career, and I've been around a long time, I've almost never seen. Right. Well, um I'm just going to uh, start taking some questions now because I can see some questions coming in which are uh, pertinent to some of the comments you've just made just now, Ted. And there's one that's come in, which is, will airdrops and maritime uh, route address the famine and malnutrition? Uh, you, you, you've said road, road is best, but surely this is going to help. Ted. I mean, I mean look, every route should be used. But the bottom line is um, the, the first uh, 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 shipment that came in by sea uh, will be able to be the equivalent of 12 to 13 trucks. There are hundreds of trucks waiting on the border in Egypt as we speak. UNICEF has two months worth of high energy biscuits and ready to use therapeutic foods that can basically sustain 50% of the population supplementing the food aid that uh, WFP, World Central Kitchen, UNRWA, Palestinian Red Crescent, and other provide. Um, and uh, it's not an either-or situation. It's an and-and situation. We also have to be careful that all the attention on air and sea diverts attention from the essential use of roads. So people who then are focusing on that are not there available to clear trucks to be able to move things in. Road is the main strategy that needs to be pursued, and there's no reason why it's not being opened up for access. That's a choice that's being made. Thank you. I can see you nodding, Natalie. Do you, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yes, also, yes, thank you. In addition, I'd say airdrops are extremely costly. There are huge logistical challenges as well. You don't know where exactly they are being dropped and who collects it. And uh, for the maritime as well, security challenges. So um, the food that has arrived, I believe, remained to be distributed throughout Gaza. So it's not an or, it's an and situation, exactly what uh, Ted was saying. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to, would you like to come in? Y yes. Yes, thank you. I absolutely agree on, on, on this, what they called alternative. Quite honestly, I will, I want to say, I, I want to be undiplomatic and say they are not even welcome for one reason. 
I'm, I'm, I'm a Palestinian. I travel in the region. I hear what people are saying. There are huge rumors about the sea route in Jordan and in Palestine, especially. These rumors are saying they are building the port in order to force people to leave Gaza. And of course, we work within communities, the trust of our communities, the understanding of what we do is important for us to continue our mission. So there are also risks beyond even this PR, what I call PR stunt, because it, we all know it is very ineffective. The other thing which I have highlighted in, in almost all my meetings, especially with high officials with the UN, is everybody is talking about the route from Egypt and from Jordan, of course, besides using the normal ports which Palestinians have access. We don't control borders, we don't control ports. The ports and borders are controlled by Israel around us, from not only in Gaza, but also West Bank. So there are Palestinian business people. Gaza used to be a very significant market for factories, for business in the West Bank. If you can transfer uh, aid from Jordan to Gaza, the West Bank is only one hour away from Gaza. And today's situation in the West Bank is quite explosive. There is even hunger in the West Bank. 150,000 workers, laborers who work in Israel no longer since 7th of October can work and bring in income to their families, can bring food on the table and generate the economy in the West Bank. The Palestinian Authority cannot pay the salaries of their staff because Israel withholds all the tax money that it collects on behalf of the Palestinian Authority. There is a very serious economic and social situation in the West Bank that is really a concern for everybody that is going to explode. So using even the West Bank, we are ready to transport thousands and business people. We have met with business people in the West Bank. They are ready to help and they are ready to contribute. Hundreds of trucks would go every day from the West Bank to Gaza in one hour. They will be there in one hour. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, please come in. First of all, of course, I agree with all what has uh, been said, but just to add to it uh, uh, as well from, an, I, from you know, uh, an INGO perspective, in addition to the fact that we need to open all borders, it's not about selection. Uh, I think you know, uh, it has to be pumped in, but also, you know, again, from, uh, from uh, a humanitarian uh, actor perspective, we, are a bit sur we were surprised by the fact that we w the, the discourse moved suddenly from aid, an aid diversion discourse where most of our donors even refused to discuss a no regret policy for distribution and were warning us about aid diversion and those same donors ended up dropping aid from the sky without any uh, any measures is it kosher for some and not for the for the rest aid has to ha has to be uh, delivered to everyone everywhere and to those who mostly need it uh, without any uh, further uh, delays thank you thank you um, I'm going to um, bring in some questions from the floor. We have some on Slido, which are great, but if anyone has posted something on Slido and actually wants to ask it, I think we have a roving mic. Um, so put your hand up if you want to ask a question. I will uh, invite you. Yes. Could you give me your name and your organization as well, please? Hi, I'm Vincent Steele. I'm the Operations Director for Action Against Hunger. I was in Gaza two weeks ago. And I've been following up Gaza for 16 years with all the different conflicts that happened during the years. And I, I can tell you, it, what you see, it's very dire and it's really alarming, as you mentioned. Now, I wanted to ask something because actually we're talking, some are talking about a one-month ceasefire, which for sure will not be enough to solve the malnutrition problem because it's a longer process. It's also a... a, a a way you could stabilize a little bit the situation, but if 
immediately afterwards it will fall down again and, and goes in, into the same uh, problem, problematic. Now the IPC report that will be published today is alarming and it's shocking, the numbers, but uh, in case we have one month ceasefire, what would be the priority, how to, how to uh, prioritize items coming in or how to prioritize the activities that are most needed? This would be the question for me. Thank you, good, good question. So uh, who would like to start? That's such a huge problem, how do you prioritize? What would you do with that one month? Yes, I, I think already there are so many contingency plans with the UN, with the clusters, etc. You are all familiar with that. But also look at the look at the experience of the last pause in the fighting in in December. Uh, there was supposed to be convoys going every day from Rafah to the north. We were responsible of taking those trucks to the north. We couldn't get even those trucks every day to the north. The first day, I think we got about 100, 150 trucks. The next day, 50. And then a couple of days, we stopped. Because there is a checkpoint in the middle of Gaza that dissects Gaza between south and north. South of Wadi Gaza, north of Wadi Gaza. People are not allowed to go. Anybody who tries to cross will be killed and targeted. Aid, as I said, our colleagues were targeted and detained while they were accompanying those trucks going from the south to the north. So the situation will be different. Nevertheless, I think the priorities are clear. We need to get aid to those most needed, as far as said, in the north. Remember, those people have not had, we're talking about 100 trucks average a day since, you know, during those past five months, but the north only got, I think, two or three times we got access to the north to get aid during those uh, five months. They are really starving, they are in need of aid. So we really need to guarantee that aid will go to the north. That's one. Two, we need to, uh, uh, and as PRCS, we are looking at the health sector as a priority. This is a priority. People everywhere and in the north are dying because of lack of medicine, Chronic diseases are not treated. Elderly people who could not move are also dying because of lack of health of healthcare, apart from those injured, those under the rubble, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we are setting up what we call advanced medical points across the whole of Gaza, including in the north of Gaza. We have asked the UN, we have asked the Egyptians, we have asked ICRC all to be able to have access to our hospital, which is still besieged in the north, in Gaza City, Al-Quds Hospital, to make it as a center for health facilities uh, in, in the north of Gaza. And the third, I'm sorry, I will not take also from my colleagues, but the third priority is to establish additional shelters so those people who are in the streets can find a, a, a kind of a, a tent, a cover uh, uh, on their heads uh, to shelter. And we are setting up five additional camps uh, uh, unfortunately, we are, we are not allowed to set up in the north. So what, what we've been told, we should set up those camps again in the south, in the south of Wadi Gaza. So we're trying to do that in the middle area in, in Deir el -Balah. Thank you. Natalie. If I may add, what would also help is to have, and Ted mentioned it, clarity on the dual-use items. So so many items that there is no established list of what items are prohibited or restricted uh, we've seen in the al Arish warehouse um, items such as crutches being uh, turned back because of the metal wooden boxes for children, scissors uh, for children, as part of a, of a play, uh, games for children. We've seen um, the chlorine generators, ventilators, so that goes to your point about health. There is no clarity on exactly what items are prohibited or not, and if there was a ceasefire, it would really be helpful to have that in terms of prioritization as well. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to just bring in a quick headline here. This is going back, reverting back to my days as a news presenter. Um, so I understand that um, the, the sort of main headline, the top headline, and possibly Ted knows much more, is that this IPC report we've just been hearing about, um, it has found catastrophic hunger and 
unfolding famine for 70% of Gazans in the north and catastrophic food insecurity conditions for 50% of Gazans in the centre southern uh, government. So, Ted, I just can you, can you expand on that? What, what's your reaction to that? Yes, I mean, the report has just been issued six minutes ago, and as you indicate, the situation in Gaza is catastrophic. Famine is imminent in the northern governorate, and there is a risk of famine across the rest of the Gaza Strip. The latest APC findings show that famine is projected to occur any time between now and May 2024. That's how they work. It's a projection uh, uh, of an outcome. And indeed, this is very much in line with the acute malnutrition figures that I spoke to earlier. Uh, I mean, this is a society that before October 7th had uh, you know, levels of acute malnutrition that were in the less than 1% in terms of the coverage. And this is, this is where we've come to. Um, so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a horrendous situation. It needs to be reversed. The consequences for children and their families are intergenerational if we don't uh, act uh, now, uh, if this is not addressed throughout the whole Gaza Strip. Uh, as, as Marwan has said in terms of the question on priority, uh, we absolutely need access to the whole of the Gaza Strip without restrictions, more access points. Uh, the priority is our food aid, nutritional supplements, um, san sanitation and hygiene kits, uh, access to safe drinking water, so that includes those pipes and those fittings to be able to repair systems so that you can drink clean water and not get diarrhea or hepatitis A when, when, when you know, you're, you're, you're trying to survive. So is it, is it just access? There's a question here from Dina. What's needed to restore nutritional programs to prevent further child m mortality? Is the answer access or is there more, more than that? It, it, it begins with access um, and a response to nutrition has to be multi-sectoral. So it's not just food. It's food, it's the nutritional supplement, it's hygiene. Uh, you know, 1.2 million people living on top of each other on the border when we can't bring in portable toilets, uh, you know, means that, that hygiene conditions are, are uh, deteriorating. Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, respect of civilian space, so hospitals, health centers need to be able to function and, and, and treat uh, those that need uh, uh, treatment. Um, all of those factors need to come in to address malnutrition. Thank you. I'll just take another uh, question. I'd like to ask Minister Genet. Um, it's, it's about the famine. Um, what, and I'm, you're not here to represent the EU, but you, what can the EU do? Well, I think there's two things we can do. First of all, call for more humanitarian access, as we have been doing from day one. Um, second, I think we no longer only have to plead for a humanitarian pause. We have, we need a ceasefire that's permanent. I think that is the only solution to make sure that you can build up Palestinian society. And that starts with feeding people, with uh, taking care of people, mental health. Um, it's, it's the whole package I think we should uh, invest in. And I think we have to make sure that um, whatever we do, that it reaches those who are most in need. And it, it isn't happening because uh, convoys are attacked or there's uh, pillaring uh, going on. So the safety, the security for people who, who we want to reach is not there as well. So I think the only solution is humanitarian and political, but that means that we need an end of the violence first. So uh, while you have the floor, I'm going to ask you another question that's come in here from uh, Luca. And um, it says, all speakers agree that access remains the key facilitator to any betterment, yet there's absolutely no sign of involved parties to facilitate access to basic needs. 
How do we create an actual impact? How to increase pressure on Israel's government? Whatever it takes, I would say. But we stay in the framework of international law, of course. Um, we can ask it friendly, but so far um, we didn't succeed uh, um, the way we wanted to. Um, we can discuss the whole judicial um, instrumentarium that is there. Um, I personally, I don't have any taboos. Whatever works to stop the violence. Of course, negotiations should be there, but at one point in time, when you need a visa ban, for instance, towards violent settlers, why not? At one time, when you have to discuss sanctions towards the Israeli government, you have to be courageous enough to bring them to the table, whatever works within the framework of international law. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to take uh, two questions. There's a gentleman here and the one behind him. We'll take both questions, please, one after the other. And if you can give me your name and title. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mansoor Ahmed. I'm a volunteer. have been serving for 18 years with voluntary services and we awarded various national and international awards. Thank you for the discussions. On the, this discussion is much, uh, topic is much discussed. I just, with regard to your violation of international law, I just need to ask with regard to violation of international law, what is the best way to ensure absolute justice, if you kindly say, because this issue is completely related with the uh, problem. Thank you. So before you, before you answer, I'll just take another question and then you, you could perhaps think about your answer. So just behind you, there, there was a question. Thanks. Hi. Uh, Nicholas Noh, a senior fellow at Refugees International. Marwan, if you can just deepen perhaps this suspicion and fear amongst Palestinians and others about the port construction off of Gaza, the potential maybe for like we've seen over many decades, the forced displacement of more Palestinians. What exactly is the concern there? And then if the concern is that this could possibly be a way to encourage or smooth the forced uh, sort of displacement of uh, people from Gaza, Egypt of course is closed, Israel won't let them in. I'd like to ask the minister from, from Belgium, what would the European position be if suddenly there is massive, even beyond the catastrophic hunger, there is a decision, uh, people are starving, they're dying, they're being bombed, perhaps they should leave on boats via this port. I wonder what the European position would be, but please Marwan first, exactly the contours of this story, perhaps I have the suspicion wrong. All right, so let's take that question first and then we will go to the minister. So for Marwan, <coughs> is there any, is there any, um, evidence to the suspicion? Is it a conspiracy theory? What do you think? Well, it's very difficult to provide evidence on, on conspiracy theories, so, but, but they are abundant. The Middle East is, is so full. But I'll tell you how I came across it. So I, I crossed from West Bank to Jordan. My sister lives in Jordan. She's a very old lady. Not so old, but... <laughs> And so she's not a politician, she's not, but she's carrying this. So she first asked me this question. Said, so they are building this port with the Americans, et cetera, et cetera, so that pe they will win, the ships will come and they will board people out of Gaza as every Palestinian is believed this is the ultimate goal of the Israel war in Gaza. You understand, those who know the Palestine question, our biggest fear is what we call the Nakba. I am a son of a refugee family who were forced out of Ramleh in 1948. I was born in Jordan, my family. And we live with this Nakba every day in and every day. So I looked then at the social media and I saw many posts which are talking about this rumor. So it is gathering some traction within the social, within the social media. And it is, so I'm not really sure. I, I of course, I, I can't, you cannot really explain uh, or, or say about conspiracy theories this way or the other way, but that is the fear 
among the people, as has been the fear all the way uh, along this, you know, during the past five months with regard to people forced out uh, to Egypt. Uh, uh, and of course, with your family, when you have fear for your children, every day, you don't know whether you will wake up alive with your family. Of course, if there is any route to get out, you will try to protect your family uh, uh, and get out. So um, um, it might be far from reality, but you never know again. But it is, it is a rumor that is getting traction within the society. We as a Palestinian organization, as a Red Crescent working with our communities are very careful. We have, without naming, because we have previous wars where also people came in, countries, aid agencies, and they were caught with suspicious activities. In 2014, we have famous case, uh, 2007 and, and eight and nine as well. We refuse even to get aid from those people because we don't want to be labeled by our community, our people as we are complicit in any sort of rumor or attempt that would break the trust between us and, and our people. Thank you very much, Marwan. I'd like to bring uh, Minister Genet in uh, to answer that. I think the question was, would the EU um, facilitate the evacuation of people fr through that way? And also the other question about the history to international law. Yeah. Of course, we help with uh, evacuation. We got our citizens out. Uh, we are asking uh, to get, for instance, from uh, the Belgian perspective, to get out the people who work for the Belgian corporation. But we need security vetting by the Israelis, by the Egyptians, and that's the first thing we can do and we have to uh, wait for. But more important is that we make Israel abide by the provisional measures of the ICJ. We have to prevent genocide. We have to make sure that we prevent ethnic cleansing. We have to make sure that we prevent resettlement. So we should also be very careful on evacuating too many people because it might be the purpose of what this Israeli government wants or, or some settler uh, movements uh, certainly want. So we have to make sure and, and we have to have them heard that Gaza is an entire part of the future Palestinian state and people have the right to live where they were born. So we have to make sure that we don't play a cynical game that, uh, that serves the agenda of, of the settler movement. So that would be the first thing and I think prevent um, famine it always comes back to the, to the same issue, more humanitarian access and an end to the hostilities. Right, and, and on the humanitarian law question, you, you really seem to think it, it holds the answer. Um, yeah, you can hear me now. So um, you have a lot of faith in humanitarian law, but I think the question is, what is the record of it being uh, international law rather what is the record of it being successful, having good outcomes, Carol, Caroline? Well, we, we've seen breaches of international law on a daily basis now. And what is really at stake is the credibility of international order. Um, and I think we should be well aware of that. Being a Minister of Development Cooperation, I talk a lot with also African partners. And they also see what Europe, for instance, is doing in the Ukraine or in Gaza or in some parts of Africa. And that's not always the same. So we should be very well aware of that if we want to keep international order um, at the forefront of everything what we do. And I think we should. That's the only offer we have uh, for a world in peace and security. It is international law and we have to make it respected um, and ICG, ICJ, ICC, all procedures are there, but the first thing is um, political solutions. Right, uh, we've got 10 minutes left.
I want to take a, a couple of questions. There's one that's only had one vote, but I think it's a very important question. Uh, as the moderator, I've spotted it. Persons with disabilities are among those most at risk in any humanitarian crisis. So what data do we have on their situation in Gaza and what's being done to ensure that aid is accessible to everyone? H who would like to answer that? Um, three of you, well, maybe one minute each. Just please, we've got 10 minutes. Um, let me make two quick points. One is um, we, we had data on disabilities before October 7th and uh, UNICEF, working with the Ministry of Social Welfare in Ramallah and other partners, has been able to use cash as an intervention, even during this conflict, electronic cash, to try to reach families with disabilities, who can then try to buy what's on limited uh, availability on the market. Uh, and there's been a specific focus on disability. But the second point I want to make is the, the, the level of, of maiming that, that has hit Palestinian children is, is unprecedented. And we're going to have an enormous increase in the number of disabled children arising out of this horrendous situation. Uh, the first thing to do, frankly, is education around UXOs and, and mines and unexploded ordinances. Uh, the whole of the strip is, is littered. Um, and I, I was in, in Gaza about seven weeks ago, uh, saw child after child after child with their limb amputated, uh, their, their stomach cut open, damage to their brains, um, the, 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 the human consequences of each of those individual children and their families and what they're going to have to go through. We're going to need to be there for them. Thank you. Um, I'll go on to the next question, which I'd uh, like to answer. And this is actually Marwan. Um, perhaps you could answer it very briefly. You were talking about uh, the casualties amongst your volunteers and your staff. Um, and this question is really, how do you motivate your teams and how do they stay motivated? Well, I, I think, as I said, wha what we have seen is dedication beyond, I'd say beyond comprehension. When you have, again, our team who is in the north of Gaza, their families are in the south, they are staying. They support and they help with the medical evacuation of, of everybody else and they stay. I think it's, it's, it's the principles that they've been educated on, it's the, it's, the, it's the dedication to the humanitarian work. But quite honestly, the first and foremost is feeling with your community. I am a Palestinian. I feel every second, every ounce of me feels with my people. And it is, it is, my, it is beyond my duty to help, to be able to do something. And I think for the 2.2 million people in Gaza who are living this nightmare, this catastrophe, it is already horrible. But for the people who are working to help, I think they get some solace, they get some, some, some meaning of staying and helping those people. And I think it is self motive I think it's this what motivates them. It's part of being part of the community, being there, feeling, and, and giving them this, this, this mission that they are helping those who are suffering. Thank you very much. We have five minutes left, so I'm not going to take any more questions. And thank you so much for sending them in. There, there are so many good questions coming in. And I'm sure uh, after this, we can continue the discussion in, outside uh, in the margins, in, in the coffee break. It's a very complicated subject. Um, I'm going to reduce that from complicated to, to simple now and go back to my with my journalistic hat on and make everyone give sound bites now for us to all take away. So uh, I'm going to start with Faris. Really, what, what would you like um, the audience to take away, please, from this discussion? Well, the first point is that 
this is not uh, a pure humanitarian crisis. This, this is a humanitarian crisis that has been politically engineered, and the solution is first and foremost political. Uh, that's one. Two, Gaza is not, uh, uh, did not, the crisis in Gaza did not start on October 7th. We can go back all the way to 1948, but most importantly is that Gaza has been under siege for the past 17 years. Uh, so all the discussion about trucks is important, but also let's remember that Gaza used to produce and export. So it's not only about the 500 trucks, but about the empowerment of the uh, population. And the last point is that it won't, the, the crisis won't end with a ceasefire. Actually, the crisis might start with a cease, once the ceasefire is there, once we see what's there on the ground. Uh, estimates are that more than 75% of the civilian infrastructure has been uh, already damaged. So it's not about just uh, you know, ceasefire and sending people back. Uh, there's a whole long, tedious process of rubble cleaning, demining, de decontamination before even thinking about sending people to live next to their demolished houses and all the process that has to be engineered. So, the, you know, we're in for, the, uh, uh, for a very long walk, even to bring Gaza to where it was before October 7th, which was not a pleasant place where 75% of the youth wanted to, to, be, to leave back then. So imagine the situation at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, Marwan, in 30 seconds, please. Okay, so first of all, I, I think it's, 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 it's appropriate to recognize those who have took principal position from day one, and I think those should be followed. And here I, I would like to salute Belgium, Spain, and Ireland for doing that. <laughs> Second. I think the roadmap, we've heard the minister's word, we've heard Mr. Borrell, I think this is the, the position that governments have to take seriously and move. My last very quick point is with regard to UNRWA, and I'm not a defendant, I am a defendant of UNRWA, but it's, I have seen some donors came to us and told us, take this money, we want to give you this fund. Of course, this fund, we knew this fund was going to UNRWA, we said, no, thank you. We understand, as a Palestinian, that UNRWA is critical, not only to Gaza, as was said, but, but to the whole Palestine refugees, and because UNRWA embodies the rights of the uh, Palestine uh, refugees. So I think some may think this is an opportunity for funding. For us, it's a red line, and we have to make it clear to donors that Anarwa cannot be substituted. Thank you. Natalie. Thank you, Marwan. In 30 seconds, I would say it is not true to say that the UN is inefficient in Gaza and that it's not getting its act together. Um, the aid is there. It's right there across the border. We all said it. All we need is political will to open more crossings, get the aid in, get a ceasefire, and for us to distribute it. Thank you. Yeah, very briefly, we need a ceasefire. Uh, it's a prerequisite for a negotiated two-state solution. And secondly, even in time of war, we have to rebuild society, not only by getting humanitarian aid in, but also by thinking about reconstruction already. And more importantly, I think we need to broaden and strengthen the room of maneuver for civil society, for civic space inside the future state of Palestine on the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip. Finally, Ted. And last, we need a ceasefire and we need access now. But as my colleagues have said, this did not start on October 7th. It was horrendous on October 7th. It's been horrendous every day since October 7th, uh, but what is needed is a political solution that allows Palestinian and Israeli children to live in peace uh, with each other. You need to go back to not neglecting this crisis. The notion that Israel and Arab countries could make peace and not deal with the Palestinian question needs to be a thing of the past. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to the panelists for your frank insights and your expertise and hearing those very vivid and moving 
testimonies of what's actually happening on the ground. I think it really does uh, serve as a reminder that something needs to be done urgently. Um, before we finish, I was going to do a sum up, but I won't because it was so eloquently done. However, there is one phrase that um, wasn't said in the sum up, and that was leave no one behind. Let's not forget that. Thank you very much to the audience, and thank you to the panelists. Thank you.